and I'm going to be showing you some from the past. One of the things I've been involved with uh, my fly tying career is setting up fly tying theaters and been involved with the many conclaves that fly fishing groups and clubs have over the country. And they uh, really highlight tires that you may not have ever met. And one of the best ones is ones in Idaho, both the Western Idaho Expo and the uh, Eastern Idaho Expo, which is in Idaho Falls. Uh, they've been doing these fly tying get together for a long time. We're talking over 30 years. So I want to do some highlights from some that I filmed in 2009 and 2010. And you will get a chance to meet some names you know, and some, maybe some names you didn't know. And one of the nice things about tying at these expos is all the uh, excitement and sounds of people going around telling lots and lots of fly fishing stories. Most of them may be exaggerated. But one of the nice things about the theater is you get a chance to listen to the tires talk about it, their experiences uh, and, and answer questions. I, I think you're going to enjoy them. Uh, we're going to start this uh, week with uh, uh, several. Uh, we'll try to give you the most information. And I know some of you are going to say, wow, you know, I don't know about the materials. Well, these are really uncut. So, you know, you do your best on figuring it out. But I think you're going to enjoy the interaction uh, with the crowd and with the tires. And really, uncut un and, I think, extremely fun. Let's get going. You know, I should have been a fan earlier than I have been. But I uh, started going with that fly, and I just really, really enjoyed the heck out of it. So this is a mahogany version. I actually started to tie this past summer, um, but the mahogany dun is kind of an important fly up where I guide, certainly on the snake, uh, to a certain degree on the south fork as well. Um, which, uh, without throwing any bells and whistles on it. So uh, the double humpy, this was developed back in the winter of 80, 81. Of a, a mistake at the fly tying vice. Uh, the fellow that developed it was basically big time mass mass producer of flies. He was doing about 12,000 flies a year, basically, for different shops and whatnot. This is before, you know, you really started to send stuff overseas to get tied. So if you wanted a fly that was tied the right way, you had to actually go to the person develop the pattern for someone who learned it the right way. <clears throat> and what occurred with this fella? Let's see what version I have in oh, I'll do red. So this fly, when it was, uh, what he had done was he had just tied about, oh, about a hundred dozen, well, more than that, several, several, several dozen Joe's Hoppers. I just finished that up. You get in a trance-like state when you're trying to tie, you know, 12,000 flies. And uh, he completed that and switched all his material out to be to begin tying humpies. Well, he switched everything out except for the hook. So he started tying these humpies, which are supposed to be about size 12, size 10 humpies, and he started tying them on a big hook meant for a Joe's hopper and he completed his humpy and found, you know, holy smokes, I've got, you know, half the hook still left. He looked at, now, you know, I think all of us, we would have seen that and just thrown it away. He, he looked at it and said, man, I bet you I could probably tie another body on there. And he, and he did. He tied on another body and then... Like the looks of it, tied on a bunch more, or tied a bunch more, I should say, and uh, used them that spring on the Snake River. When back then the river opened in April, now it's open year-round. This is the Snake River in Wyoming, 
and it worked like an absolute charm. Very, very, very simple fly just in terms of material requirements. Um, you know, perhaps the one downside is you have to, you're dealing with deer hair. A lot of people just kind of hate using deer hair, particularly when you have to form shellbacks and whatnot. Um, but just like anything else, it's it all comes down to practice. Just repetition, repetition, repetition. I used to hate spinning hair. I just hated it because it just looked, all my flies looked like trash. And then I just settled down and basically started tying them and tying them and tying them. And uh, now they look as good as anything else I tie. So it's, uh, working with deer hair, you just keep practicing and off you go. Get a hair stacker. Now the guy who developed this pattern never used a hair stacker. He just clipped them and tied them. He just went right in. They were, you know, you had off hairs, you had guard hairs sticking up all over the place. He never ever used a uh, up, upright and divided wing. And you're going to notice here, I'm not going to do an upright and divided wing either. I think this looks something close to a... This is a big hook. It's about a size, size six hook, so... We're going to create a pretty big fly here. The deer hair that we're using here, this is mule deer hair, and it's coming specifically from the neck, the flank, kind of up towards the cheeks. Extremely hollow, hollow hair. So it floats like a son of a gun. The downside is it's brittle. It breaks apart pretty easily. You can see how big that deer hair tail is. If I tried to get this a bit more, you know, quote, imitated, and I tried to use something that was, uh, oh, you know, maybe just a few strands, they probably wouldn't last a day of fishing because they're, they're, because they're so brittle. Jack Dennis, we believe, is the first person that actually took moose hair. He didn't like how big this was. He wanted something more imitative. He took moose hair and began to use it as the tail material. And there, that's a super strong, sturdy, heavy-duty type of material. And he uh, was able to get it there. He could be more imitative because it wasn't such a big, big, gaudy, uh, gaudy tail like this is here. But this is the version we like. This version works like a charm. Now again, upright and divided wing, we're not going to do that with this fly. This, this fly is going to be tied very much like the original double pumpkin was tied. And I'm using good road thread here. Since I like using flat wax for this kind of fly because man, you got to cover up a lot of material. Flat wax takes fewer, uh, fewer wraps. Back a bit. to there. I'm going to actually bring this thread back a bit. I want this to go right back to the base of the tail without anything showing. And that's just me. You know, if you have a gap there, it's not probably going to matter any iota. The fish can't even really see that gap there at all. There's your first shell back. I'll tell you what, we'll meet you halfway here. I was originally going to do a foam double pumpy. I decided to do just a double pumpy. And if I have legs here, let's see if I do. I'll tie in some legs. So I'll tell you what, I'm just going to need it as a regular, regular double hump. You can tie in legs right here and then use your, uh, use your hackle.
This thing is going to have a lot of hackle. This was a heavily hackled fly. Um, literally, you're going to use about 32 wraps of hackle on the entire fly. That's how the original was tied. And now I'm just going to put that up there. You're going to see it's going to go right down past the eye of the hook. And I'm not going to be trimming that stuff out of there, and I'll tell you why. Later, I'm not going to be trimming the bottom of it. The idea of trimming it, it allows it to lay lower in the water. And that's something good to do with a lot of flies, but there's a reason why you want to have your hackle for this fly remaining big, full, and somewhat gaudy. In 1994, this fly, the double humpy, caught what was the largest cutthroat ever caught in one fly tournament, uh, 25 and a half inches. Very, very big cutthroat. And those cutthroat live up there. They, they live on the south fork, they live on the snake. You only get a few cracks at them, but they're, uh, they're out there. But there's only been one other fish, a 25 and three quarter inch brown, that's been that's been caught that's been larger than that fish in the one fly. I believe that's right, 25 and three quarter inch caught by Bud Chatham. Yeah. So what I did, I doubled this up, so I got double. Double hackle here. Pinch that up right there. Bring this forward. Some of that hackle will get tied down. I'm going to put that right about like so. Get some more deer hair. I'm going to be honest with you, I haven't tied one of these in a long time because it's such an old school pattern. I just kind of decided on a whim to do it today. And the same thing, you're just repeating all those last steps that I just did after I completed the tape. Get all of that covered up. Take a peek at it. I think we're pretty close. Trim some of that down here just to speed everything up a bit. Now I'm going to bring that shell back forward. Get her crunched down. Okay. You can see there's a little bit of a gap right there. I mean, very, very subtle. You can take care of that just by pushing that body back, boom, just like that. Um, Howard Cole, a really good tire, lives up in Jackson, Wyoming, has this great quote, don't take shit from your materials. There, I didn't take any shit from my materials at all. Another set of hackle here. And again, this is gonna be big and gaudy. Fly. Most people are fishing this as a hopper. Do you think yellow? Yellow is the most important, or probably the most popular color. Red is right on its tail. Yellow, people think because it imitates the color of so many of other bugs up there, grasshoppers, but the people that are, quote, in the know, so to speak, that fish this, fish a uh, late season stonefly we have up there called the Placenia. And the Clasenia, the males have very, very, very short wings to the point that they cannot fly. So when they're on the water, they are scurrying. They are scurrying and making a big commotion. And that attracts the fish and the fish hit. That's the magic of this kind of fly, all that hackle. As this thing is in the water, you can let it swing or you can go ahead and, and start, you know, giving it twitches, giving it little strips. And the wake that it creates, the wake it creates is almost 
a spitting image of the wake created by a scurrying stone. If I put legs on this, it would kind of throw that off. It would throw that, that wake off of it. So, you know, legs are great. Most of the big, big flies I'm tying obviously have legs, but they're not by any stretch of the imagination a must. For this fly, they'd probably be a little bit too, uh, wouldn't be as good.